And our next speaker is very much a youth himself, 19 years old. He was the youngest ever recipient of the European of the Year Award. He's the founder of a fabulous nonprofit that I will let him speak to you about. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm hand for Felix Finkbeiner. Thank you, Felix. Thank you. Through your day-to-day -day work and events like this, you're all becoming experts in negotiating and bringing about social change. So what I'm here to do is to convince you to share your talent and use your talent to help us tackle some of the biggest challenges of our time. So what are these biggest challenges of our time? I would argue that there are three. The first one is global population growth. We currently have about one billion people on the continent of Africa. But the UN projects that this population is going to double by 2050 to 2 billion people, and then double again to 4 billion people by 2100. It's probably unavoidable, um, that first doubling until 2050, but the doubling again until 2100 is certainly avoidable by investing in building wealth on that, that continent in those 54 countries. The second big challenge relates directly to that, and that's global economic injustice, so poverty. Could you all please imagine we have a, a big balance, a scale, and on the one hand, on the one side of that scale, we add all the wealth of the bottom half of the world's population, those three and a half billion people. How much of the wealth of the top um, earners of the world would we have to add to the other side of that balance to equal it out? Is it the top 1%, so 70 million people? The top 0.1%, like 7 million people? Well, the answer is, is it's eight people. It, the eight richest people of the world, from Jeff Bezos to Charles Koch, own as much as the bottom half of the world's population. And I think the third big challenge which I would argue is the most urgent challenge is the climate crisis, is global warming. And I think what's currently happening in Syria is the best example to understand why this is such an incredibly important and urgent challenge. We all know about the civil war that's been going on in Syria since 2011. But what many people don't know is that between 2006 and 2011, Syria faced its biggest drought in 900 years. And during that drought, 80% of all herd animals in Syria died, and 800,000 farmers moved from the countryside into the cities, leading to a lot of unrest. And there are some documents published by WikiLeaks that show that the Syrian government didn't know how to deal with these people. And that's when the Arab Spring arrived and the civil war started. I'm not trying to argue that the civil war is only the result of the climate crisis, but global, global warming clearly contributed to it. And what this illustrates is that the result of the climate crisis won't just be droughts and food shortages, but it will also make our political conflicts worse. And this is why it's such an important and incredibly important challenge for us. These stripes here show the rise of temperature in the last 150 years, since the year 1850. Each line shows the average temperature of that year. In that time, our global average temperature increased by one degree. But this isn't a linear process, it's an exponential process. And if we continue on the path that we are following today, we will surpass two degrees and lay the groundwork for two degrees in the next 30 to 40 years. So what can we do about this? Let's look at this globally. Here on the y-axis, we've got the amount of CO2 that we are polluting per year. And we add up over 30 billion tons per year. And here we've got the years from today until 2050. If we continued on our current trajectory, 
um, we will follow that red line and produce another 1,600 billion tons of CO2, which points us towards a temperature rise of five to six degrees. But the global scientists, the climate scientists tell us that if we want to avoid catastrophic climate change, we need to keep the temperature rise below two degrees. That's that green line at the bottom. So how can we bridge the gap from the red to the green? The first important step was already taken by the global governments in the year 2015. In December of 2015, all governments of the world came together and every government as part of the Paris Agreement made a pledge of what they are going to do to help fight the climate crisis which is incredibly important. But even if all of these governments um, implement their pledges, we will still only follow that black line, and le which leads us towards three or four degrees plus. If we want to avoid temperature rise beyond two degrees, we have to do more. And what can that be? One of the most important things is planting trees. And to tell you why, I want to take a step back and tell you what we children and youth of Plant for the Planet have been doing for the past 11 years. When I was nine years old in fourth grade, my teacher asked me to give a little presentation in my class about the climate crisis. And when I prepared that presentation, I found out about a lady from Kenya called Vangari Matai, who together with lots and lots of other women in Kenya, managed to plant 30 million trees in 30 years. So I told my classmates that we should plant 1 million trees in each country of the world. And many of them liked the idea, so a few days later we went outside and planted our first tree. And two local journalists reported about it, so some other schools started hearing about it and planting trees as well. And then and a slightly older student built a very simple website which was essentially just a ranking among local schools of who had planted the most trees. And lots of schools tried to outcompete one another, and that's how it spread. After one year, we had planted 50,000 trees, and after three years, one million. And children and youth all across the country started, uh, across the country and the world started joining us. But they weren't just planting trees, they were doing much more. They started giving presentations in their schools and in front of rotary clubs. They started talking to their mayors and their governors convinced them to do more to tackle the climate crisis. On three occasions, our members have spoken to the UN General Assembly. And many have had sit-downs with their presidents or talked in front of their parliaments to convince them to do more. And all of this isn't an accident. We encourage them to do that. One great example is Jana, who gave a, a speech at the conference a few months ago after the CEO of Deutsche Bank and one of Germany's governors, Armin Laschet. And after that speech, after that conference, the journalists only reported about her and her governor, Armin Laschet, then invited her to a meeting in his state house. And she tried to convince him to make his state carbon neutral. And we encourage all our ambassadors to do exactly this by educating them at our Plant for the Planet academies all around the world and at 1,200 academies in 67 countries, we've empowered 70,000 children and youth to plant trees, but also to give speeches and so on. And we've had the incredible help from the Schrana Negotiation Institute that has trained many of our ambassadors all around the world to get engaged, to get involved, and to talk to politicians. All of this is probably why the United Nations asked us to lead the Billion Tree Campaign. That's an initiative originally started by our hero, Vangari Matai, um, about 12 years ago. And the goal, goal, original goal of that initiative was to plant a billion trees, but so far with the help of governments, companies and organizations all around the world, we were able to plant 15 billion trees. So a while ago, we children and youth asked ourselves, what's the next step? What should the next target be? Where do we go from here? And because of that, we had two big questions. The first one was, how many trees even exist in the world? 
And the second one was, how many additional trees can we plant? So we asked lots of climate scientists and ecologists, but soon noticed that nobody had any answer to, answers to these questions because nobody had tried to answer them. But after a few years, we found a team of three researchers at Yale University in the US, and they did a three-year research project for us. And they came back to us with two main conclusions, two main answers. The first one was, that we currently have about three trillion trees in the world. That's about 400 trees for every person in the world. And the second, more important answer was that we can plant another one trillion trees. And if we manage to plant these trillion trees, then they would capture about a quarter of human-made greenhouse gas emissions. So they wouldn't solve the climate crisis, but they, they'd be a sort of time joker they'd buy us some time, they'd give us some time to reduce our global greenhouse gas emissions and therefore bridge that gap that we saw in the graph at the beginning. So it is our mission to convince the world to plant these uh, trillion trees, to convince governments, to convince govern uh, companies and everyone to contribute. But to be able to negotiate effectively, we noticed that we have to show that it's possible, that it's feasible to do this. I noticed that, or I learned that, when I was talking to the governor of a state in Mexico, and he told us the idea seems great, but we've tried this, and our average survival rate was just 22% after the first year, which means they planted lots of trees, but after one year, 78% of the trees had died, which makes it incredibly um, expensive and ineffective. So we wanted to show that it's possible to do this more efficiently and more effectively. So we took charge of about 22,000 hectares of forests, of destroyed forests on that Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, which is about 50,000 soccer fields. And we today employ 100 people that restore this forest, planting one tree every 15 seconds. And now, after planting there for three years, we've achieved a survival rate of not 22, but 94% of the trees we plant there. And we do this with a price of just one euro per planted tree. And of course, to convince companies and governments to help us, we must make this transparent. So anyone can see exactly where these trees are planted and who donated and funded those trees we planted. And beyond companies that are supporting us to make this happen, one of our main sources of income is the Change Chocolate. This project originally started about six years ago when we wanted to do a project with the global chocolate industry. But not a single company wanted to support us. So one of our ambassadors joked, let's make our own chocolate. And this then turned into the Change Chocolate which is not only carbon neutral and fair trade, but has now become the most sold fair trade chocolate in Germany. And the best part of it, with every five bars of the chocolate we sell, we earn enough money to plant a tree. And we're currently working on an app for the chocolate. So if you're out in the city near a store that sells a chocolate, you'll get a notification and know where to, where to buy, know where to go shopping. And a few years ago, we asked the astronauts on the International Space Station if they wanted to try the chocolate as well. And shortly after that, 12 bars of the chocolate were on board the Albert Einstein, the space shuttle to the International Space Station. So two bars of chocolate for each astronaut. And since then, we call it astronaut food. And to be able to negotiate effectively with change makers, in polit if they're politicians or in business, we have to have some clout, we have to have some influence. And we build that, among other things, with our campaign, Stop Talking, Start Planting, where we cover famous people's mouths to show that something has to happen. For instance, we did one such picture with the King of Spain, and after we did it, it was in all newspapers, and not just in the newspapers, but on the cover pages. Here it's on the side, but we count that as well. 
And many of our ambassadors around the world have also protested to show that something has to happen. Like in front of the um, German chancellery in 2009. But we also understood to, to really motivate people all across the world to help us and to get those trillion trees planted. We must make it as easy as possible for anyone to get involved. And to do that, we are building an app that's first going to be a web app and then available for iOS and Android as well. And if you go in that platform and register yourself, you have your own personal tree counter. So for instance, my target is to plant 1,000 trees and I've already planted 259. Now if I'm out in my backyard or anywhere else planting a tree, I can register that tree, I can add the location, pictures, measurements, as much information as I want. But what if I can't plant trees myself because I don't have a backyard or simply I don't want to go through all that effort? Well, then you can use that platform to donate to tree planting organizations all around the world so they will plant those trees for you. And any tree planting organization around the world can register and you can donate directly to them through the platform. And Plant for the Planet won't take any cut of the donation, but the donation will go 100% to the tree planting organization and you can donate in 80 different currencies. And what we're building here is not just an easy tool for anyone to donate, but we're bringing transparency into global reforestation projects. Because any organization that wants to register as part of the platform has to give us the exact polygons, the exact locations where they're planting trees. And we're working together with a cartography or a company, Esri, to then take satellite pictures of these areas and use algorithms to evaluate how much how many trees are growing there, how much biomass they're accumulating, and therefore how much CO2 they're capturing out of the atmosphere. So we can then evaluate for tree planting organizations all around the world how effective they are and pass that information directly on to their donors. And all of these trees are then, um, then um, counted in your tree counter. And you can engage with others, you can look at the profiles of anyone else planting, um, trees as part of the platform and follow them so you will get notifications when they plant more trees. And in the Explore tab, you can see all the 15 billion trees that have already been planted all around the world. You can see all the forests that currently exist and where we have potential to plant new forests in the future, to plant those trillion trees. And in our leaderboard section, you can see which countries which companies, which organizations have done the most, have planted the most trees. So the beta version is already live right now. We're improving it and going to launch the iOS and Android versions by the end of this year. But we are really just ecologists with a small team helping us build this. I know all of you are much better at, um, at building systems like this. So if anyone wants to help us make this a success, make this app as awesome as possible, please come up to me, um, please talk to me. We would be very grateful. I believe that to be able to negotiate effectively, um, what you need is you need a cause. You need conviction and you need to believe in what you do. And you need to be able to convince your team to believe in what you do. And doing something as valuable as tackling one of the biggest problems of our time is going to help you incredibly in doing so. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. Um, I think we do have a, a few questions. Um, so while we get the slide up, um, Felix, what advice would you maybe give to other entrepreneurs that kind of um, maybe are younger, maybe feel like that um, they don't necessarily have a cause or they have a cause, but they're overwhelmed and they don't know where to start and how to start. Um, what advice would you give them? How would you suggest that they negotiate that journey? Well, of course, what we have now, what no generation before us had, is the ability to connect to people all across the world very easily. And I believe that by creating a very simple concept, very simple system, um, like tree planting in our case, but a very simple solution, you, it's very easy to mobilize people to help you. We didn't have any great insight back then when we started. We didn't have 
a system or a team or anything really, but we had a very simple message and a simple idea, a few kids planting trees, and because it was so simple, it took off um, with very little, um, very, very little contribution on our side. Great. Um, now, there's a very interesting question up here. You talked about how you negotiate for climate change, but how has what you're doing trickled down into negotiating for social change? I would actually argue that there's really not that big of a difference between um, tackling climate change and social change because these topics are so incredibly interlinked. I think, mm -hmm. as I tried to point out at the beginning, it is climate change that is going to be one of the biggest, um, biggest challenges. But in general, when we tackle issues like this, I think the reason we were effective is because we didn't just demand that governments do something, that companies do something, that other people tackle these issues. But what we did in, on a very small scale is do something ourselves, take little steps in the right direction to tackling this challenge, in our case, um, climate change by planting trees, and then combine this with a call to the powerful of the world to um, do something as well. And I think that's why it was effective. And I think uh, a lot of what you were talking about and a lot of how your company or, or, or the organization grew to the scale it is, is, is through word of mouth and, and it just kind of exploded. And there's a really great question here and saying, from Lawrence, it's an exciting project. What's preventing the Trillion Tree campaign from going viral? What would it take? Do you think it has gone viral already? What we've been mainly doing is focusing on the tree planting ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, which obviously is an important contribution and is very important to build credibility for what we're doing, but we have to be more outgoing and spread our message wider. That's what we're trying to do by building that platform right now, but that's obviously not the core of our competency. Or the core of our competency is tree planting, but we hope by building this we will have the ability to spread our message that way. And the people here, what are, some, what are some things that they can do or ways that they can support the campaign as entrepreneurs, as startup founders, as investors, as just everyday individuals? What are some things that they can do to help support this, this campaign of yours? Well, you can either help us um, build our platform or if you want to do something with your company, what you can do is you can make your company carbon neutral. It's generally very easy to calculate what your um, CO2 footprint is based on the number of flights you have um, in your company, your office space, and a few other metrics. And then you can compensate these emissions by planting trees. With about five trees, you can compensate a ton of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, do you work together with other eco-friendly organizations? Again, what we're trying to do with the platform is um, make it as inclusive as possible to support tree planting organizations all around the world, especially the very small ones. Like um, there's an organization called Say Trees in Bangalore. They do excellent work, but almost nobody outside of Bangalore knows about them. So we're trying to give them tra visibility on an international stage and allow people to support them directly um, to help them. And I see that someone mentioned Ecosia and they are um, a very good partner of Plant for the Planet and part of our Trillion Tree campaign. Uh, and then somebody wants to know, again, if you could repeat for the audience, what is your platform called? The app, I believe, is, is the question, just so everyone can... Um, in our testing beta phase, it's currently at trilliontreecampaign.org, mm -hmm. but in future, we will, uh, we will host it at our main site at plantfortheplanet.org. But if you want to look at it right now, it's at trilliontreecampaign.org, but by the end of the year, we will migrate it to our main okay. site, which has traffic. Uh, Elizabeth has a very good question. How do you educate tree planters on which tree to plant and where? How do you empower them? There's two parts to that answer. First of all, we always encourage um, our members of Plant for the Planet and any tree planting organization to talk to local foresters because in many countries of the world, these are, they have excellent networks with a lot of valuable local knowledge because what's really important with tree planting is always planting the right species in the right place, so local knowledge is important. But beyond that, we have a um, partnership with an institute at the ETH Zurich, uh, a 15-member uh, institute that we helped set up um, two years ago, and they advise tree planting organizations at a global scale on how to do their work right. Okay. Um, 
And there's a very important question here, and I think a lot of people might ask the same thing. How do you get higher ups to listen to you, given your young background? Do you ever feel disadvantaged? I think that actually the fact that we are an organization with children and youth was actually a big advantage for us instead of a disadvantage. Because if back then, um, in 2007, uh, a 50 year old would have said, I'm going to go out and plant some trees, nobody would have cared. But because we were such young children and youth, we got an incredible amount of media attention, which not only allowed us to grow, but which amplified our message um, to grow a quite a wide audience. Thank you, Felix. We are finished with you here today. Thank you so much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, a hand, please, for Felix. Thank you, Felix. Yep.